Good afternoon, everyone. I am Amanda Perez, and I'm with the Center on Brain Injury Research and Training here um, in Eugene at the University of Oregon. Thank you so much for joining us today for the first in this um, winter webinar series. Uh, today, we're going to be doing a panelist type of webinar, um, which means that we've got three main speakers. So today, we've got Lori Powell, we've got David Cracky, and we have Kurt Toombs. And each one of them is going to have a chance to talk with you about their areas of specialty. My role here is going to be as a moderator. And so um, I will be talking with you a little bit at the beginning about what we're going to be looking for as far as participation goes from you and how you can contact me if you have any trouble. So for those of you who are just getting used to Zoom, um, there's going to be a panel at the bottom of your screen. And so the main way that we're going to be interacting with you guys today is going to be via chat. There's a little bubble at the bottom that says chat. And then a little bit more to the right of that is one that says Q and A. So as we go along, we really want to hear from you guys. And we have found that if you're anything like, like us, um, we tend to forget our questions if we try to save them all until the end. So as you are um, listening to things that our speakers are talking about, please go ahead and write down your questions and comments. We'll have moments that we can take breaks and talk about that. And we'd really like to hear from you. So please take a moment to write in your thoughts and questions as we go along. Also, if you do run into any kind of technical issue, if you're not hearing things, if you're not seeing screens, um, please use the chat function. I'm happy to try to troubleshoot that with you. Um, and then keep in mind this is being recorded. So if you do need to pop out or you can't watch the whole thing, we will be posting this on our Seabird webpage um, early next week. So with all of that housekeeping out of the way, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to Lori. All right. Thank you, Amanda, and welcome to all of you uh, for participating in this first in our three-part Eastern Oregon Winter Webinar Series, and we're going to focus today on an introduction to brain injury for Eastern Oregon providers. And I want to first acknowledge uh, that the support for this project comes from the Administration for Community Living uh, TBI Partnership Grant. So uh, my name is Lori Powell, as Amanda said, I'm the project director for Oregon's Traumatic Brain Injury Partnership Grant based at the Center on Brain Injury Research and Training, otherwise known as CBERT at the University of Oregon. And I'm just pleased to be able to join Kurt Toombs, the executive director of the Eastern Oregon Center for Independent Living, and David Cracky, Oregon's Brain Injury Africa Coordinator uh, at CBERT. Um, I'd like to also acknowledge today the very hard work that went into putting this webinar series together, uh, acknowledging Megan Jones, the lead coordinator for this series, as well as our other colleagues at Seabrook for their in vital input. Uh, Amanda Perez, who's moderating today, uh, Laura Beck, and Karen, Carolyn Saracino. Okay, so with those brief introductions, um, uh, I'd like to, we'd like to know more about you. And so we're going to uh, administer our first poll is to find out a little bit about your background. And so you'll see it there on your screen and take a few minutes to uh, respond. And um, I'm going to go ahead and um, Amanda, shall I go ahead and just move on with the presentation? Um, so we actually have about, looks like we're at 40, 5% of people who've responded. So if we give it just another couple of seconds, I'll go yeah. ahead and end the poll and then we can get um, a shared out response for all of those who participated. So it um, looks like we have just a couple more coming in. Um, and for those of you, if for some reason you don't see it, go ahead and put in comments in the chat. I see a couple of you are putting that in there. So um, for those who are under that other category, We've got somebody from Juvenile Probation, Umatilla County Veteran Services, a program analyst at Housing and Urban Development at the Portland Field Office, um, Tri-County Veteran Service Officer, Law Enforcement Investigator, Middle School Teacher. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and end this poll and share that out so you guys can see where those fall. Um, thank you everybody so much. Looks like we've got people from all over. Excellent, which is what we were hoping for. Um, thank you so much for, for sharing that input with us. And we'll have a, a second poll at the end of today's webinar to get your input on our next two webinars in this series. So um, thanks so much. Let's go ahead and move on 
to uh, a basic outline for today's session. Okay, so I'll briefly um, share with you why we put this webinar series together in, in the first place and pr also provide a very brief introduction to the topic of brain injury. And um, it's, uh, I have, get to have 10 minutes to do that. So <laughs> it's a huge topic and we know there's just no possible way to do it justice in that amount of time, but we just wanted to set the stage. That is really our primary goal uh, for now. However, uh, along with your registration, you uh, hopefully received three uh, informational flyers uh, with educational and training informational resources that you can access right away to find out more information about brain injury. These are well vetted um, uh, sources of information, both uh, basic information about brain injury and um, the kinds of services and supports that are out there. We'll talk more about that later. Um, and then Kurt will take over from there to describe the fine work that's being done at the Eastern Oregon Center for Independent Living with a focus on supporting people with brain injury. Dave Cracky will then tell us about advocacy related work going on, on in our state to improve access to coordinated care for people with brain injury. And then finally that second poll where we get the, your input on topics for our future webinars. So let's begin with why this webinar series um, and and we'll begin with this statement that was part of the flyer that uh, advertising the series you may not be a, a trained brain injury provider uh, but you pr probably serve people with brain injury whether you know it or not um, well, let's unpack that a little bit with some scenarios I understand there's a middle school teacher here. So uh, my first example is, a, is a, 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 in the field of education. Let's say I'm a high school teacher or a college instructor, and I have a student athlete uh, that is really struggling with their academics. And they're having difficulty with headaches, fatigue. Uh, it's very difficult to stay organized in turning in homework. And this student is at risk for dropping out of school. Or let's say I'm a community health worker and I'm working with a veteran who is homeless and I'm trying to help this individual apply for benefits, but it's been a challenge because they're struggling to remember to come to our appointments um, and filling out the paperwork itself is a, is a huge challenge because of all the details and other related paperwork that's necessary. Or let's say I'm a behavioral health counselor working in the space of substance use disorder treatment. And I have this one client who's really struggling uh, being able to participate and stay focused in a group, a group treatment setting. Um, this individual tends to dominate the conversation and I'm just not sure what's going on and why this is the case. This is different than some of the other clients that are participating in the group. So, with those three scenarios, there are many different reasons why one might experience these kinds of challenges. Um, but we're here today to take a moment and explore the possibility that individuals um, might come with a history of brain injury, uh, that they might be part of a vulnerable at-risk group for brain injury, and that that injury is sort of hidden from view. It doesn't seem obvious, but something's not quite right. So let's move on to this question, do you serve individuals in any one of these following uh, vulnerable at-risk groups. So let's take a look at this next slide. So here, what we've done is categorize different risk factors according to demographics, occupational um, uh, hazards, sports and recreation activities, and then people experiencing different life situations. And, and, and obviously, these, uh, there's overlaps between these different categories. But if you take a look at each one and just sort of see the, the, that in the case of demographics, males are one and a half times at higher risk for brain injury than females, very young uh, children are at risk, teenage years are a risky time. Uh, and if you're 65 years uh, or older, there's increased risk for falls, for example, and hitting your head. Or it, your occupation puts you at risk, um, certain military, occupational uh, activities might do that. Um, 
if you're a farmer working a uh, around large equipment, maybe falling off a tractor uh, in ranching or construction, for example, falling off a ladder, falling off a roof, or sports and recreational activities such as football, skiing, snowboarding, which is not on there, um, rodeo, horseback riding. And then people experiencing previous TBIs, traumatic brain injuries, or multiple concussions. So think, let's think about the student athlete that I mentioned earlier. That student athlete, let's say they were a football player, have maybe experienced multiple mild concussions over a period of time, but that has a cumulative impact. Or if someone is being treated for a behavioral health issue, substance use disorder, and or mental health, there's maybe an elevated risk that there's a history of brain injury in their life. Or if someone has experienced domestic violence, um, the risk of hitting the head and or strangulation leading to lack of oxygen. And so, and you see those other situational um, uh, variables. So now that with this uh, as a template, you can kind of think, well, maybe I have somebody in my in my caseload in my classroom that I might be working with and I'm going to start to think about this a little bit more as a possibility for them. So now let's stand back a little bit and, and look at some basic definitions. So what is acquired brain injury? This is a, a broad umbrella term that is indicates an injury that occurs after birth and causes damage to brain tissue. Okay, and there are many causes uh, of acquired brain injury. Traumatic brain injury is the one we're focusing on today, but we want to really keep in mind there's other ways that the brain can be injured through stroke, infection, lack of oxygen due to strangulation, near drowning, uh, overdose uh, toxicity due to overdose tumors, and so forth. And so what is a traumatic brain injury? That is a, 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 a TBI is caused by a bump, blow, or jolt to the head, or a penetrating injury, gunshot wound, for example, that disrupts the normal function of the brain. Um, this first bullet is really important to remember. The effects of a TBI may be temporary or permanent. So a person could have a, a, a single concussion, and the majority of the people that have a concussion, a, considered a mild TBI by some, maybe not so mild by others, um, the majority do tend to recover and do fine, but a certain percentage do not. And particularly, as you see lower down on that list, if there's multiple TBIs or multiple concussions, that can have cumulative effects. Severity can range from mild to severe for a brain injury. And as I've said, a concussion is a brain injury. The leading causes of TBI um, are predominantly due to falls um, and then followed by traffic motor vehicle crashes, um, some category of unknown sources or uncertain sources of brain injury, um, assaults uh, and struck by or against an object. And Here's a here's a, a, a statement that's often um, a tag to TBI or brain injury in general. Why is it called the invisible disability? Uh, because it is common for people with TBI to have significant cognitive, behavioral, and emotional difficulties, persistent symptoms that, that follow them after that initial stage of recovery. And there's no obvious or physical impairment to signal to the world, I, I have an injury to my brain. Um, so that's a huge piece to hold on to. And then the second bullet is equally important, just as no two people are alike, no two brain injuries are alike. So it, you can't sort of look at one person and say, I think I know what brain injury is now because that's just one experience of that. Um, and that diagram that you see uh, really pulls together all the different areas that can be impacted. Yes, the physical medical conditions attached to the brain injury, uh, it's not just the injury to the brain, there can often be uh, headaches, fatigue, and so forth, like the student I mentioned earlier. Uh, cognitive challenges, that can have tremendous life impacts. If there's persistent issues with attention, with memory, that lead to difficulty with organization, planning, and so forth, so much of life can fall apart when those uh, uh, parts of our being are challenged. Um, behavioral control and so and emotional emotional uh, changes uh, whether it's grief in relationship to the brain injury or 
um, irritability because it's just really hard to get through the day and so forth. So here's a more comprehensive look at signs and symptoms of brain injury. And I really want to stress the, uh, that not everyone will experience all of these symptoms and, and that some of these symptoms overlap with other conditions and may be confused with them. Um, and that's just kind of the way it is. So there might be, in the case of cognitive or emotional changes that get attached to brain injury or associated with brain injury, there may also be overlap with, say, post-traumatic stress symptoms. So what I'd like to do now is just take a step back and, 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 and stop using words and let images tell the story of potential life impacts that are associated with brain injury. Um, again, not everybody will experience dramatic changes to their life, but often in, in the case of uh, persistent symptoms, uh, more severe injuries, there are tremendous life impacts. Um, if it's hard to focus, like in the group treatment for substance use disorder, because I have a history of brain injury, I may not be successful completing my recovery. Or I'm a student, I'm super motivated to get through college, but I can't, and I'm gonna be a, a, a less able to find meaningful employment. Or I have a job and I'm not showing up on time because I'm tired, I'm fatigued, I have headaches, and I've lost my job, I can't afford my rent. So, um, just holding those impacts in mind as we move forward now with a conversation about one of our, uh, the work, the fine work of uh, the Eastern Oregon Center for Independent Living and serving and helping people get connected to resources who have experienced brain injury or concussion in their life. So what I'd like to do now is turn it over to Kurt Toombs. Thank you, Lori. I'll just jump right in and provide an overview of Eastern Oregon Center for Independent Living. We have three offices, one located in Ontario, Pendleton, and the Dalles. And EOCIL has two primary functions. One, uh, to operate the Institute for Disability Studies and Policy. The IDSP is the research arm of our agency. It produces actionable research, white sheets, and we disseminate those white sheets to centers for independent living around the nation for system change advocacy. One example of actionable research is the termination of parental rights of people with disabilities. In many states and in Oregon until recently, people, people living with uh, disabilities, uh, their term, so in many states, and that includes Oregon until recently, there were codes or statutes on the books that allowed uh, the state to terminate parental rights solely based on disability. So if you live in Texas, California, New York, just to name a few, and you live with traumatic brain injury, and someone calls the state CPS and expresses a concern that they feel uh, you cannot provide adequate care for your child because of your traumatic brain injury, then the state CPS and the family courts uh, would remove your child, could remove your child, and your parental rights could be terminated solely based on your TBI disability. It's alarming. The second function, primary function of EOCIL, is to provide consumer controlled services to individuals living with disabilities in our 13 Eastern Oregon counties. Our staff meet with individuals experiencing barriers to living independently. And they work together to complete a comprehensive assessment to flush out the root causes of, the, of these barriers. I will tell you before joining the Eastern Oregon Brain Injury Network, EOCIL's assessment process did not include direct questions to flush out po a possible brain injury. We assumed an individual was aware, that, aware of their brain injury and would self-disclose it as a disability. We did not consider the possibility of an unknown brain injury and how it could positively or negatively impact an individual's ability to achieve an independent life. As a result, as a result of Eastern Oregon Brain Injury Network, Resource Network, our staff have received traumatic brain injury training and we've incorporated critical questions into our assessment process that will help individuals with disabilities evaluate if one, they have, a, they have a possible brain injury. Two, 
how the brain injury may be impacting their ability to live independently. And three, identify the initial action steps for obtaining further specialized evaluation and develop a treatment or independent living plan. So let's take a look at EOCIL's new assessment tool for traumatic brain injury. We serve, we're fortunate enough to serve on many different task force and networks. And this is a, a, a new component of our assessment, human trafficking. We've been working with the National Human Trafficking Task Force, and we've identified some key questions to ask and incorporate in our assessment process. So it's just another example of partnerships and how it, 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 uh, it trickles down to the ground level. So the next slide, Lori, is actually EOCIL's um, traumatic brain injury questions that we are now asking. And I won't read all the questions, but I will tell you that if someone answers yes to any of the questions, it's an automatic level three or four for e e our staff which generates a referral to a specialist. Now, it, being in the independent living uh, movement, an individual can choose not to take that referral uh, for many reasons. One, they might not realize or may not acknowledge that the, the brain injury has a negative effect on their life and that they need to take action steps so that they can live more independently. This just stays in their file and each time they come in, if they experience a negative impact in the community or, or in their life, it allows the staff to, uh, to have that conversation with them again, reevaluate it. And eventually, hopefully, uh, the individual, when they're ready for a referral to a specialist, we're able to make that. I'll go ahead and pause now and just turn it back to you, Lori. Okay, um, thank you, Kurt, and so grateful for what you all have done at EOSIL to integrate this into your intake and ongoing support process. It's, it's, it's wonderful and uh, um, certainly inspiring us to, to want to share this with others as we are today. So thank you for that. Um, let's go ahead and move on now to, you know, we've gone from basic introduction to brain injury to, an, to an ex, a really vital example of how brain injury awareness has been integrated into a provider system in the, it, with the EOCIL. But now we're gonna take a step back and look at advocacy efforts in our state to improve access to services for all Oregonians with brain injury. And with this, I'd like to introduce you to David Cracky, Oregon's Brain Injury Advocate Coordinator. Lori, thank you very much. And thank you to everyone uh, who is on this webinar. It's really exciting for me to see so much interest uh, throughout the state, especially with our friends in, uh, in Eastern Oregon, where we've been working so hard to develop the Eastern Oregon Brain Injury Network, of which Kurt and others are such a, a big part. I am here to discuss the, the policy side of things. I'm an attorney. I was a litigator for 30 years before uh, being uh, appointed Oregon's Brain Injury Advocate Coordinator, uh, which happened in 2018, pursuant to the uh, Administration for Community Living Grant that Lori uh, discussed at the start of the webinar. It was a tremendous honor for me. Uh, this is an area that I had been working in for uh, close to 20 years. I've been representing or had been representing people with brain injuries uh, for all 30 years of my practice. I understood because of that representation, the individual struggles that they had, the problems that they had certainly with their uh, physical uh, health recovery, but also the way that the brain injury impacted their, the rest of their life. And this is something that I'm sure you all understand intuitively. If you don't have the cognitive ability to understand these very complex processes that we have in our society, you are at a complete disadvantage. When my clients would come to me uh, or other uh, advocates, they would have the opportunity to work with someone um, who, who understood the process and was able to guide them through the maze toward uh, receiving the benefits, for instance, that they needed. Where people with brain injury did not have that type of advocate working on their behalf, they were lost. 
they were mired in a maze. It added to the negative outcomes, the negative consequences of their brain injury. I got involved with the policy side back in the mid 2000s when I was asked to become a board member on the Brain Injury Alliance of Oregon. I was happy to do so. I was asked to do that because of uh, prior legislative experience that I, that I had. And that was in 2005. About a year and a half, two years later is when Max's story came to, the, came to light. Max Conrad, who is in the picture there in the lower left, that's my, me and Max, uh, the signing ceremony of Max's law back in 2009 at the governor's uh, office. Max Conrad was a 4.0 student. He was at Waldport High School. Uh, he was on his way to Cornell. He was the quarterback of the Waldport High School football team. He suffered a concussion in uh, one of the Friday night games. It was a, you know, it was a pretty serious concussion, but back in those days, we uh, collectively, for the most part, had no idea what to do. In fact, as you all probably are aware, uh, it was told, you know, he was told he had gotten his bell rung, basically rub some dirt in it, get back out there. In my legislative work, I always need to not only have a protagonist, which Max clearly was in this case, but also an antagonist. I work well when I know that there's someone out there that I need to influence, that I need to make change their behavior because it's hurting, harming other individuals. In this case, it was a football coach uh, from uh, outside of the Portland area who was minimizing concussions to the point where he was denigrating players who had concussions, just making fun of them. And to me, that was completely, completely unacceptable. So myself and my great colleagues at the Brain Injury Alliance of Oregon, uh, trust me, it was a huge team effort. I by no means was the was the solo uh, leader of this group by any stretch of the imagination. There were the great, great leaders throughout. But regardless, Max's dad came to us and he said, well, let me finish with Max's story. I'm sorry, I left that one dangling. After that first concussion, Max, as was common in that, in that day, was allowed to play the following week, despite the fact that he was still suffering that concussion. And he suffered a second concussion in that second game. It was a relatively small hit. We've all seen the, the film from that game. We've seen the hit on film. And where perhaps otherwise he would have just gotten up, shaken himself off, gotten back into, onto the field, into the next play, he instead lapsed into a coma, which he was in for four months. It was uh, diagnosed as second impact syndrome. I do understand that there is some controversy around that diagnosis currently. But the reality is, is that his brain was in a weakened state when it was, sorry about that, he was in a weakened state when he was concussed that second time, and it led to that cascading neuro, neurological impact that resulted with him being in a coma for four and a half months. And when he woke from the coma, he was uh, severely compromised cognitively. Needless to say, he did not go to Cornell. He did he instead went to a group care facility and ended up um, uh, 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 very disabled as a result of this second concussion or the combination of the two concussions. Ralph Conrad, his Max's dad, came into the BIAOR offices and said something has to be done. In consultation with some wonderful doctors, Jim Chestnut, Mick Kester, and others throughout the state, a pro program or a protocol was developed, which is on this slide, that required the coach recognize that a concussion or a possible concussion had occurred. And the language is when there is a blow to the head or body that results in signs, symptoms, or behaviors consistent with a concussion, then that coach, coach must, must, shall remove the player from that game. That player is then prohibited from going, coming back into the game until he is, first of all, referred to a qualified healthcare professional as defined in the statute. And there's a list of uh, qualified healthcare professionals who can then provide the player with a safe release to return to play. 
And at that point, the return to play protocols kick in and uh, we, we Siebert website and, and the OSAA, Oregon Student uh, Activities Association website, uh, really is detailed in terms of that uh, return to play protocol. It's a graduated return to play protocol, light exercise, medium exercise, full exertion, as long as the player does not lapse into uh, additional concussion symptoms. This was the nation's first enacted youth concussion law. I'm very proud of that. We were working in, in tandem, kind of on parallel track with the state of Washington. Uh, Oregon's law was enacted, it's actually, that is a legislative, a legal term, about three weeks before Seattle or before Washington's was. Uh, regardless, Oregon and Washington truly did lead the nation in the development of youth concussion laws and within four years, all 50 states had an analogous law. So next slide, please. We knew that we had not done our job completely with Max's law because of the fact that Max's law was restricted only to high school athletes or school-based athletes. And we knew obviously that there was a huge component out there of uh, the rec league, the classic leagues, the uh, CYA, the uh, uh, United Way, all of these leagues that so many of our kids have grown up in, and quite frankly, where you have many more young athletes uh, playing many more games, practicing much more often than you do merely when you confine it to the high school setting. So uh, Jim Chestnut and I, Dr. Chestnut at OHSU and I set out to kind of expand Max's Law protections to all young athletes in the state of Oregon. And we found our kind of our person who would be the face of that law in the person of Jenna Sneva. Jenna is sitting in the picture to the lower left. Uh, that's Senator Steiner Hayward, who at the time um, uh, was the sponsor of what is now known as Jenna's Law. Same protocols in Jenna's Law as in Max's Law, except with regard to recognize, remove, refer and return. Uh, however, it expanded, as I said, to all youth athletes. And then I did something that I, that I knew I wanted to do, and that is that I included this concussion education component. Jenna's law requires one parent of all players and the players themselves who are over the age of 12 to take a concussion awareness course. We estimate that that's somewhere around 150,000 Oregonians annually uh, taking this concussion education. Um, I love this education component of it because my firm belief is, is that the more people know about concussions, the more they're aware of those risks, and the more likely we are to avoid uh, the terrible tragic outcomes that we had with uh, Max Conrad. Okay, next, please. In my position, as uh, Oregon's Brain Injury Advocate Coordinator. I have been very fortunate to be on the team that has worked to adopt legislation and administrative rule changes uh, in the past couple of years. Uh, the credible history change that is currently on the, on the screen now allow, is a recent change. Melissa McCart of Siebert did a wonderful job of moving this forward. And basically it addressed the situation where a child at some point in his or her life suffered a traumatic brain injury, and yet there was no uh, history of it. There, excuse me, there was no medical record of it. So basically we now are able to show that where there is a credible history of a traumatic brain injury, that that student now can access, for instance, the 504 plan or an IEP based on problems resulting from that prior traumatic brain injury. Okay, next. <clears throat> A soapbox that I have been, have been standing on for about seven or 10 years actually, it relates to return to school after a concussion. We know that approximately 88% of our young athletes or young, student, young students who sustain concussions are going to heal uh, for the most part without residual problem. However, during that initial healing uh, time period, they are going to need academic accommodations. We solved that or attempted to solve that problem with a new law that was passed this past session that will 
provide teachers with an if-then type of form that says, for instance, if the student is having trouble with bright lights, then allow that student to wear a hat. Allow that student to sit somewhere in the classroom where those lights won't be such a problem. If that student has a problem with fatigue, then allow that student to have additional time for homework and tests. Uh, allow them to uh, leave class early. Allow them to have other accommodations to accommodate for those problems individual to that particular student. We're very happy, very, very pleased with that getting into the uh, statute. And again, it's a first of its kind in the nation. Okay, next please. And Lori, I see I'm going a little bit long, but uh, I think we might have a little bit of time. Where we are going is really exciting for me. We have, I'll jump down to number two, we have uh, drafted coding legislation. Uh, what we know is a problem is where a person presents at a, an emergent care situa situation in the emergency room, the uh, emergency department, urgent care. They may have other, other medical conditions that take priority, uh, such as orthopedic or uh, lacerations, contusions, things that unfortunately tend to distract from those signs, symptoms, and behaviors that are consistent with a brain injury. And so we are trying to figure out how we can encourage those frontline initial uh, portal into the medical system, how we can convince them to really take the idea of brain injury seriously and to chart that because it makes their li the, the survive brain injury survivors' lives so much easier as they move forward. We also uh, have, and I'll go up to the top one, we have a brain injury resource facilitation needs assessment survey. Uh, we will have it within the next few weeks. Uh, the survey will be ready to send out to all of you who are participating in this webinar. The purpose of the survey is to allow us to learn more about your experiences, the needs of Oregon's brain injury community, and this in turn will help us advocate for legislation and other policy changes to support brain injury uh, in, in, individuals who are brain injured. Uh, we are still waiting for the IRB approval for our Spanish language translation. Therefore, we, we're, we're kind of in that, that gray area, but we're anticipating that we'll, it will be available to be disseminated sometimes, sometime within the next few weeks. And when you get it, we really encourage you to uh, take the survey and then to please disseminate it and share it with your network of not only providers, but also uh, survivors of brain injury. The more responses we get, just the better information we are going to be able to uh, understand and then uh, craft our legislative and policy changes. We are also working on a statewide brain injury resource facilitation legislation. Resource facilitation basically is establishing a network of navigators who will connect the brain injury survivor to the available supports and services. We know that that is a huge problem right now. That's essentially what the survey is going to be identifying even further. And I have drafted language that is being, uh, it's with Legislative Council as we speak. Uh, we know that with COVID, there are going to be some severe restrictions on bills that have a fiscal, uh, meaning that, that cost money. And so we are not uh, optimistic about this session, but we are optimistic looking forward to the uh, 2023 session. Okay, next. Okay. I guess that's actually, I'm sorry, I guess that's it for me. There's a lot more I could say, but I've gone way over my time. And so I will now turn it over to Lori. Again, though, if anyone has any questions or any ideas, uh, that's where this starts. If you have any ideas for future policy changes, please let us know because that's where that's information that I can then take to the legislators and open that discussion for future policy changes. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Dave. I hope I think I'm unmuted. Can you, Dave, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, I can, Lori. Okay, good. <laughs> All right. Um, so that's, it's been a grand sweep of information uh, for, for all of us today participating in this. Um, let me just provide a bit more, and this ties back to uh, what I mentioned early on in this um, webinar, is that there's, just, there's so much to learn about brain injury, its impacts, uh, and so forth. So we've provided you with three one-page uh, informational sheets 
Um, the first one being general information about brain injury from uh, well-vetted nationwide resources um, and uh, can't recommend them highly enough, such as Brainline, uh, which is there for you know, survivors of brain injury, family members, caregivers, um, the uh, Rehabilitation Hospital of Indiana fact sheets about brain injury that a provider, if you take a look at those, they're written for the survivor of brain injury, but they're so helpful for all of us to learn about the impacts and uh, one page, easy to assimilate and can be given out as information to um, people that you serve. And then after that, we have the, um, sorry about that, my, there, training and education module. So if you wanna go deeper, um, this grant for, for example, has uh, supported three, four webinars so far on the topic of brain injury and behavioral health. Uh, and the links to those webinars are available in this particular handout, as well as the most recent uh, webinar on the topic of screening and accommodating brain injury uh, in vulnerable and at-risk populations. Um, they are free, um, they are meant to be used and shared. So please take advantage of those when you have the time. And then more information about brain injury and underserved populations. And what we mean by underserved populations are, are, are those groups, for example, people who are marginally housed, who are homeless, um, who may be uh, victims of domestic violence. And, and it's, they've kind of flown under the radar of our awareness that they might have a brain injury and that with screening and support could be elevated and, and, and able to move forward in their lives more effectively. So that's just a little overview of the, the, the takeaways for to, from today's um, webinar. And we do have enough time now. Oh, yes, we have the upcoming webinars. This gets us to our next poll. I think this is a good spot for Amanda to step in because we have the next two webinars broadly defined and, and oriented around uh, the topic of who serves and how to serve persons with brain injury and then systems. But we wanna hear from you. Uh, about your interests and in particular topics that uh, we can expand on. So please feel free to go ahead and, and fill out the poll and we'll take a look at uh, the results in, a, in just a bit. So thank you, Lori. Uh, the poll question is live and I see lots of you are starting to respond. Um, while we're waiting for that to come in, I'll just answer a couple um, of questions. I know some of you registered after I had already sent out the original handouts and I'll be sending out the next handouts with a copy of this recorded webinar by early next week. Um, and then I also saw that there's a question about are we providing um, CEUs for participation in this webinar. Um, so we don't actually do CEUs, but we do um, professional development units. So if you do want a PDU certificate, we're happy to do that. Um, and Sarah, um, I also saw that you were able to watch the whole training. Um, and yes, this was recorded and we will be making that available. Um, okay, so we have, um, looks like about 43 people who responded to our topics. I'm gonna go ahead and pull and share that out with you guys. All right, so um, looks like a range of topics there with the, the most um, interest indicated for how to screen for brain injury and how to support someone with a brain injury. That's excellent. Um, and, and we hope that uh, the resources we provided today, the, the one page flyers will help you get started in that um, area and know that we have upcoming webinars um, with Dr. Caitlin Sinovec on the topic of screening coming up in uh, January and April. So, and she's, a, she's really dialed in as an occupational therapist with the screening process. So, um, so we can remind ourselves about that in our upcoming webinars for Eastern Oregon, but we know we, we can just assure you we have really dialed in expertise already lined up to provide that kind of training in, in the future and strategies for supporting for someone with a brain injury. Absolutely. Um, I, can, I can call out um, the Ohio Valley Center for Brain Injury Prevention and Treatment. Um, they're uh, accommodating the symptoms of brain injury. It's a, it's a PDF, freely available. Uh, um, go to that link, download it. It's an excellent resource for just really straight up support uh, 
uh, strategies uh, that really focus in on the executive function system. So that system is the one that deals with uh, our ability to think ahead, to formulate goals, to plan, organize, self-monitor. It's our higher level thinking system and it can be impacted in just about it, every brain injury, uh, particularly where there's more persistent symptoms. Um, so it's a really good resource for that. And then there's others as well. Um, so um, that's great. Thank you for your input on the poll. And if there's other topics that weren't listed in the poll that you want to throw into the chat, please feel free to do so. Um, and then right here on this screen, of course, we have the upcoming webinars uh, on December 2nd on, uh, and, uh, and again on February 3rd. Um, and then finally, I just want to plug the fact that we are trying to build and support the Eastern Oregon Brain Injury Resource Network. So if you're inspired by this topic, want to learn more, get connected with providers, um, uh, there will be a post-webinar evaluation where you can indicate that. So, uh, and then finally, if you want to get in touch with Kurt, with, with Dave or myself, here are our email addresses. And we have uh, a, a good chunk a few minutes left if there are any particular questions that um, Amanda as you look at the chat that would be addressed to Kurt or to Dave or to myself we can we can give it a go um, yeah so I have just a couple of housekeeping related questions that came in um, and then I have a question for you I think related to um, veterans so um, on the housekeeping side for those of you who would like to get a certificate, we will be sending out an evaluation survey um, and that certificate will be available for download at the end of that email. And it's a very short one, just should take a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. We're always happy to get your guys' feedback. Um, and then Jean wanted to know how to register for the upcoming webinars. So I believe that link is going to be in the handout. Is that correct, Lori? Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I believe so. Um, you know, the handouts, the informational handouts, no, but we can maybe consider resending um, with the recording of this today's webinar, the links to the next two, just kind of modifying that flyer so that people yeah. have it all in one package. Okay, great. So we'll make sure that we send that out to you in our email so everybody can have it um, and they can register for the next one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, this is a question that came from Kirsten Ray and this question says, what services exist for veterans with TBIs? And are there any um, cross-agency partnerships to serve veterans, especially in rural areas? It's a very good question. Um, and I'll start, and Dave and Kurt, feel free to jump in. I think I'll answer it by kind of saying that the reason why we want to um, get this resource facilitation program on its feet, Kirsten, is to do exactly what you're describing, is to get more um, cross-pollinating between agencies so that the services are not siloed. We know so many veterans are not served within the VA system. And so, uh, you know, this Eastern Oregon Provider Network has been our very beginning, you know, uh, chance to start to get folks to talk to one another. And, uh, and Gus Bedwell has been a vital part of our team to help us learn about those systems. But I, um, I'd say we're at the very beginning stages of making those connections. Um, in terms of information about serving veterans with TBI, we did put a general link into the informational flyer that we hope will be helpful for community providers working with veterans um, on, on a range of issues. And, and I will stop there and let Dave and, and Kurt offer any other thoughts or comments to Kirsten. Lori, I'll go ahead and, and pick up there before Kurt. Um, first of all, uh, Kirsten, yeah, you've, you've really hit on an important uh, area, and it's something that we have been looking at, trying to figure out. And the, the good news is that the, vet, the, uh, the VA and the Oregon Department of Veterans Affairs understands that brain injury is a really important uh, uh, condition or problem and that it has not been given the uh, the priority that it, it should have but that's changing now I will throw out a couple of things number one we see in the studies that are out there we see huge uh, uh, co-occurring incidents between brain injury and uh, veterans with mental health problems uh, veteran and brain injury and veterans with substance abuse disorder uh, literally in the 45, 55% co-occurring uh, between the two. 
and we recognize that as a as a real big problem. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is to get that brain injury screening uh, in more detail, or, or excuse me, more applied more throughout the veterans community. There are some wonderful uh, benefits available for veterans who are, for instance, struggling with housing, and that can be for any reason, but uh, brain injury is likely involved somehow with those particular veterans. And that's through support services for veterans' families. There's some federal dollars available to help with housing. Uh, the veterans, uh, the VA, understands that traumatic brain injury is the quote signature injury from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and they are uh, treating it accordingly. Uh, the veterans service officers are also a tremendous resource uh, in Eastern Oregon and throughout the state uh, for uh, just available services. I would encourage you to check with the veteran service officers in your area. We are also working with uh, the BSOs, the veteran service uh, officers, uh, to address the problem where other than honorable discharges occur and the behavior problem or discipline problem that led to that other than honorable discharge where that may have been a, the result of or the, the, you know, the result of a brain injury. For instance, lack of inhibition, uh, acting out, anger control problems, things along those lines that maybe wasn't tied back to the brain injury and therefore the, the veteran was uh, given an other than honorable discharge, losing a lot of the other, the, the benefits that would be available to him or her in the event that there was a, uh, uh, an honorable discharge. We also know for a fact that uh, uh, domestic or, or intimate partner violence or violence, just assaultive behavior is a huge problem, especially with female veterans. Um, or uh, female soldiers and the chain of command issues that are uh, present presented in those situations can sometimes be very difficult uh, for the victim. And so we're doing our best to figure out what policies might uh, be applicable in those situations. And finally, we're really trying to enhance and figure out how we can uh, create a more robust screening process so that we can get those veterans with traumatic, with brain injury identified and then directed to the appropriate supports and services. And with that, I'll um, send it over to Kurt. I think uh, um, one good resource, of course, I'm biased, but I think Centers for Independent Living across the, the nation would be a tremendous resource for people living with traumatic brain injury. One is that it would get, if uh, centers provide peer-based services, so everyone that, that works for a center, most everyone that works for a center are, are people with disabilities. Uh, the benefit of getting someone into a Center for Independent Living would be uh, crisis management. They would be able to uh, assist with planning to, to, to uh, alleviate the crisis and then start looking at planning uh, to stabilize uh, the individual's uh, situation. So if someone's looking, at, at some, if someone's at a high risk of being homeless, uh, due to the traumatic brain injury or any disability, uh, centers might be able to assist to stabilize that situation and then look at what needs to be put in place with the individual uh, to allow them to live a more independent life. Uh, there are six certified uh, uh, state uh, certified centers for independent living in Oregon and, they're, and nationwide they're in every state. Excellent. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Amanda. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, I was going to say we've got three other questions that have come in since then, and they're um, branching a little bit off of that particular topic. Um, this first one is from a psychiatric nurse practitioner in Pendleton, um, and this is Kara, and she says she can benefit from learning resources that she can refer to for evaluation. Um, she says she encounters several patients that fall on her radar as possibly having TBI, poor medical histories because of barriers is a huge factor, mm -hmm. and she hasn't had good luck with referring to PCPs because they send it back to her. She'd like to be more helpful in getting people to the right place. All right. Okay, so, Dave, uh, would you like to go ahead and, and start with that question? Uh, sure, Lori. I'm 
you know, Louise, as, as much as I wish I had a, a great answer for you, I don't, unfortunately. And in fact, this you are identifying the reason why we are doing what we are doing is that when there are individuals who have these co-occurring conditions, whether it be substance abuse issues and a brain injury or anything else, where do they go? Uh, you know, you did the right thing. You referred them back to the primary care physician uh, who then I suppose you would hope would have some resource available to them. Now, if they are lucky enough to be in a, a group that has uh, kind of institutional care available, and I'm thinking in terms of the veterans, for instance, um, you know, that, that is something that, uh, that, that you need to consider. But otherwise, you really have just pointed out the problem, that there are needs and they are unmet and that we need to do a better job to, to figure those needs out. So I wish I had something more specific for your uh, question out in the Pendleton, I believe Pendleton area. Uh, I don't at this point, unfortunately, unless, of course, they fall into a special need uh, or a special population designation, such as uh, veterans. Mm -hmm. uh, again, you might uh, uh, ask around your, your area, and I know that that's a terrible answer to give you. So I wish I had something better for you. Uh, but again, that, those are the questions that we're trying to address. And, and just to build on that, um, Dave, is... Um, you know, the other members of our Eastern Oregon provider, brain injury provider network are not with us today. But the goal of that network is to take questions such as yours and say, who in the area could help with this situation? You know, uh, because we're, we're ba you know, I'm based in Eugene, Dave's in Portland. We've had the privilege of getting to know Kurt and then the other members of the team, Kathy Gannon, um, Derek Earl, a physician working out of Hermiston, who has specialized in brain injury and concussion, and finding these wonderful pockets of, of interest and, and ability to network within the region. So, um, so like Dave said, we don't have a, a clear direct answer to support you in this, but what we're also trying to do is work on the issue through provide, by building this network up. So if you're interested in joining us, or even if it's like, I don't know if I have the time for that, but I'd sure love to hear more about who's out there who could help me with additional assessments, uh, neuropsychological evaluations, for example. Um, but the screening uh, of brain injury itself doesn't have to be done by a clinical neuropsych. Um, the Ohio Valley uh, uh, TBI ID method, for example, that's, there's a link for that in the resources, um, can be administered by anyone that's had a little bit of preparation and training. There are links for how to learn how to administer that. And um, it gets you started and it gives you maybe a place to, to, to land with going to a, a primary care physician, for example, and saying, here's clear documentation of a potential lifetime history of brain injury. We need to work together. Uh, and, and perhaps you have something like that already, but um, that's, that's, we're sort of trying to build from that foundation up uh, and provide the person-to-person -person connections as well. And, and Lori, I might throw out there that one of our network uh, team members in Eastern Oregon are the folks at LifeWays. Mm -hmm. And yes. you may, uh, Louise, may be able to give a call over to LifeWays to see, I know they do a lot in behavioral health. I'm not sure if they have, oh, there we go. Excellent. Hi, Kara. Um, you know, maybe you can make a connection there and at least ask whether or not they can help or if they have someone or resources that they can send you to. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I, so, and I think it's, it's absolutely vital, uh, the partnership between the medical uh, world and the psychosocial peer-to-peer uh, -peer, um, social organizations. And so I think it's important to, to either get, get the individual into uh, like some of our other partners, the AAAs in our counties or the Centers for Independent Living in your area, so that uh, they can provide peer-based services. You know, what an individual, when they go into the doctor and they're looking for medical treatment, is much different than going into a, an organization that provides social services. They, com they uh, complement each other, and it's necessary to have both. As a person with a disability, um, it's important for medical treatment, but it's also important for me to hear from my peers what's working and what's not working for them. Right. Kurt, that's an excellent way to sum up today's um, webinar. We are just about one minute past the hour, and 
while there may be other questions, feel free for those of you who have them to give us your um, contact information. We'll try to answer them as we can. Um, but I just want to thank all of you the, who have attended today, the panelists and the staff who put this together um, with abundant gratitude. Thank you for joining us. And we hope we see you in December and in February uh, again. Amanda, anything else before we sign off? Um, no, I do see that there are several other questions that are in chat and Q&A, so I have saved those mm -hmm. um, and I will do my best to reach out to you. For um, those of you who have received my emails, um, please do feel free to contact me directly and I'm happy to send on those questions to Dave or Kurt or Lori. Um, and we want to make sure that we stay connected with you. We're so grateful that you've all been here. Absolutely. And you can write us directly too if you like. Um, sorry we didn't have more time, but uh, Okay, well with that, I think we'll say goodbye and thanks again for coming. Thank you everyone. Bye. Bye.